All right. I'm here with Corey Tyler and uh, welcome Corey. We, I know Corey through um, Across the Aisle, we were calling it a uh, weekly open forum online to bring people together that have diverse political viewpoints and to practice listening and hearing one another across the great divides that are particularly happening at this time. It is November, 2020 now, and uh, still reeling from our election and trying to sort through in the US here, our, our elections and politics and everything. So Corey and I and a couple others are co-facilitating this, um, this space to, to practice hearing and understanding even when we disagree and bringing, Corey also has a long background in nonviolent communication. And so we have that in common. And as Corey, I'll in a moment, have you say a few words about yourself, your background, whatever you'd want people to know for this context. But Corey's uh, work with uh, Agape and um, we'll probably be talking about some conscious capitalism as well. Uh, but uh, Corey, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Anything you want to say about just yourself to kind of orient folks who are yeah. listening, watching? Yeah, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be a guest along with other uh, similar guests that you've had. And uh, I have such high esteem for them like uh, Robert Gonzalez and others. And I really am uh, eager to have conversations that bridge this divide of the, the three chairs, as you call it, and talking about consciousness and communication. So um, I have such a deep uh, interest and affinity to talk about stuff like this, and I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, good. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah, so I like to say that there's these, these three kind of pillars that I'm super passionate about. And, and one is consciousness. And, you know, what is that? And how to, uh, you know, for human beings. Um, and, um, and what I call, you know, civilization, but you could also say the social political level of things. And particularly now, there's just so much going on and uh, socially and politically. Uh, and, 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 the, and the commonality you and I have with communication and nonviolent communication, or I, what I like to more generally call empathic communication. So what my what I like to do in these conversations is just sort of maybe focus on either the, I usually start with the consciousness piece and how that relates to communication and, and then getting into maybe the, the larger social political kind of civilization level of, of uh, what we're dealing with. So how to, how you and I can talk about the way to understand that and how, you know, how to get with the work that we do mm, to support, <clears throat> to support what's happening in the world in a productive, you know, constructive way. Yeah. So how about let's, uh, let's start with the, the consciousness piece and with your background in, in uh, with, with Agape, Michael Beckwith, uh, if you want to say a little bit about like for you, how does, how does that relate to communication? You know, all that your background in that, have, have you been bringing that into your, uh, your communication? learning and, and practice and offering that to others. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, these questions. Um, I could go on and on about them. So I'll try to stay focused and lasered here because I'm really excited about topics like this. So I, um, I cut my teeth as it were as a spiritual practitioner at the Agape International Spiritual Center based in LA. And right now they're located in Beverly Hills and it's the uh, founding minister, um, Michael Bernard Beckwith, who started it back in the 80s. And so I started attending that spiritual center in the 90s and mm. followed up and became a, a practitioner, which basically means like a, a meditation or a prayer counselor, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I like in this conversation that we're about to have is sort of like um, analogous to a tree. And so for me, the first part of it is the roots. And I feel like my roots are in uh, spirituality. And what I mean by that is cultivating a practice where I'm getting to know myself. 
And so oftentimes we think of a spiritual relationship with the cosmos or the universe or a certain deity or a number of deities. And for me, it's really about getting connected to myself and my relationship with myself. And so these tools of you know, meditation, of uh, having a vision board, um, reciting affirmations, putting um, certain mantras on our mirrors or our, our walls, mm -hmm. that what they're essentially doing is they're a feedback mechanism for me to get back to a conversation that I'm having with myself. Mm -hmm. who, I, who am I in this world? What, what am I as a human being? Or like I like to phrase it, well, I didn't come up with the phrase, but uh, being a spiritual being, um, having a human incarnation. Mm -hmm. What does that look like um, in terms of how I relate with myself and how I'm talking with myself? What, what am I believing about the world? What am I believing about myself? So my sense of consciousness mm -hmm. is really about, about what does it look like for me to have a relationship with Corey? What am I telling myself about me? What am I, th therefore, what are my values about me? And then externally, what are those values that I see in the world and, and how I relate to other people? So it's really, um, my years at Agape, and I worked on staff there for nine years in the prayer ministry mm. and getting those calls of people that were in all sorts of places in their lives. Um, some were being evicted, some were depressed, some were just ending relationships. Some people were calling because of something they were grateful for. But ultimately, me developing a relationship with myself allowed me then to extend a certain awareness around the people that I was talking to on the phone. Mm. And so when I would pray with them, um, I would pray from a sense of not trying to fix them, but, time, but trying to um, um, have an awareness of the whole person that they already were. Like I wasn't trying to shift a situation. I was trying to remember that mm. we're all interconnected. So mm. a few moments ago when we started the conversation, I noticed that you may have had a, a friendly furry pet close to you or in your vicinity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, it's like understanding that, you know, the energy and the life force that moves through your furry four-legged friend and the energy that moves through us as, as human beings, it really is the same. It's the constant energy source and force that moves through all of life, through the trees and through the plants and through the clouds and the planets and the stars. And so um, being at Agape, working with Reverend Michael and all the people in that community really allowed me to um, develop a sweet relationship with others, but most importantly, myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like how you're, how you're talking about that. Um... And in terms of communication, kind of bring it like that's been a real such a journey for me. And it sounds like for you in a way, like how to how to how to concretize it. And and to Marshall Rosenberg, who who started this, the work you and I do together, nonviolent communication, that how do you take these sort of spiritual principles and bring them down to earth, so to speak, into the actual languaging of talking to ourselves, talking to others, and like as you said, how to even just how do we see ourselves and others? How do we perceive and experience, you know, what what we are and who we are? And um, but I like so I played with things like you know each of the four components of communication: observation, feeling, need, request. How to relate to those in a way that's not just about using language, but about different dimensions of like being aware and what is, you know, like what is consciousness and what is, what is the mind and the body and how we relate to the mind and the body. Um, but to bring that into, into observing and the language of observation and feeling in the, and, and, and being present in our bodies with awareness and then putting language to that. And then need or needs is this sort of universal realm that's sort of beyond a separate self and things like that, that kind of really playing with how those components can invite us into like what you're talking about, this in a sense of spiritual experience, but really grounded in the difficulties we experience and, and, and sort of how do we, how do we language that? How do we relate to that? Um, 
that reminds us how we're all, how we are, like, as you said, how we're all connected, how we're all part of maybe something larger, holistic. Yeah. But, but to actually do that through the, through the kind of the mechanics of communication. And I find that hard, like it's easy to get. And I find a lot of people studying this work of nonviolent communication that can get so caught up in that languaging. Yeah. yeah. So technical about those distinctions and trying so hard to kind of mentally get it right with the language that you'd sort of lose that, that presence, that just being aware and the, that being in a deep way, because you're so into the thinking and the doing of the communication language side. So I'm curious if you've kind of how you've uh, experienced that almost tension in a way and how you kind of work with that, um, yeah, in whatever way, you know, hearing me say that, what comes to you to, yeah. to share? So it was about eight or nine years ago, I was working at Agape, and we had somebody, we would have these monthly meetings with the practitioner core. And one day, we had this guy show up with two puppets, <sighs> a giraffe puppet <laughs> and a jackal puppet. And it was my first introduction to nonviolent communication. And so I had found out that Marshall Rosenberg had actually been there years before at Agape, but mm -hmm. this particular gentleman was, um, had studied with Marshall and it was like, uh, sort of like the gateway to the gateway drug to like this huge universe mm -hmm. of, of how to sort of bring spirituality into the world, into the, into the world where people are maybe not into meditation, but they're having a, uh, a conflict with their spouse. And they, so for me, it was like this wonderful entry point to like, oh, there's this really cool technology in terms of mindfulness and consciousness. But it was like almost preaching to the choir, literally. Mm -hmm. and because people were coming to seek this knowledge and um, an understanding of, of spirituality and it, it, it fed them, but it was sort of like people would come and seek that out. But I was really interested about, okay, what about the person that is driving past right now or, or the person that at the supermarket and, and had a run-in with, with someone or a disagreement? So for me, nonviolent communication was a wonderful um, exploratory jungle to kind of go back to the tree. It was the trunk for me. It was like the substance of mm. really being able to utilize consciousness in a practical way where there the high potentiality for connection mm -hmm. could be met. Mm -hmm. And um, in that moment, I was like, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. Mm -hmm. And I knew in that moment that it was, it was like an extension of my spiritual awareness. Mm -hmm. And so being a parent, um, being in partnership, for me, it was like, now I had all these really beautiful tools that I could apply um, in my relationships. Mm -hmm. Challenge to your point was like, I became really good at the four steps, mm -hmm. right? I became really nuanced in it. And I remember one time having a conversation with my mom when I first learned this stuff and we're standing there in the kitchen and I'm talking about, you know, my observation and how <laughs> I feel it. And she kind of starts looking at me, like, you're doing something right now, uh -huh. like, you know? And it's like, yeah. I got caught red handed, you know? Uh -huh. And it's this idea of like, if we're not careful, <laughs> it's like, I can start doing something. Yeah. And what I started to learn and when the doorway opened up for me of awareness is sort of taking the essence of spirituality and the essence of nonviolent communication and bridging them. So sometimes I practice MVC without saying a word. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it's about my awareness of connection first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So for me, yesterday we're driving in the car and my two sons, one is seven, the other is 11, and a conflict starts up. You know, one says, okay, well, one brother is teasing me and the other brother says, well, he's teasing me. Mm -hmm. And I realize there's this part of me that wants to go into it. All right, well, let's go through the steps, observation, mm -hmm. feelings, <laughs> needs, requests. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I stop myself, John, and I'm like, I'm going to take a deep breath. Because in that moment, I was triggered. I was frustrated. Uh -huh. So this path of communication 
it's really been wonderful me, wonderful for me, particularly as a father, particularly a, as a partner, because I realize, kind of going back to the consciousness part, it starts with me. Mm. And I liken nonviolent communication, which I actually term clarity communication, oh, that's because right. for me it's really about cultivating clarity. And when I get clarity within myself the potentiality of getting clear with someone else is like very, very high and understanding where they are in their world. I liken it to, there's this uh, jazz musician named uh, Thelonious Monk. And I love watching and hearing Thelonious Monk because when he plays, it's like he, he inhabits this zone, this consciousness of you, if you will, mm -hmm. that is very improvisational. But there's this idea that the jazz musician has to learn the scales at first, right? Yeah, yeah. So for me as a, a practitioner in spirituality and communication, it's like, I wanna learn observation, feelings, needs and requests. There's something very um, foundational about that. And there's something when I watch and hear a, a jazz musician, a musician like Thelonious Monk where he's learned the scales so that he can forget them. Yeah, yeah. And there's something that's very nuanced and free and liberating and effective about holding this spaciousness that is like he's in the zone. And when I'm in that zone, it's like I've learned the scales and I've learned the foundations of NVC. And what does it look like for me to just be there with someone without even getting into the formula of it? Yeah. And I found sometimes that someone, I'll be with someone. And I'll just be breathing with them and I'll just be looking at them in the eye. Mm. I'll be like, you know what? I don't know what it is you're doing, but I feel so heard right now. Mm -hmm. I feel so listened to right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that for me is the juice and the jazz of nonviolent communication. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking about the so there's how do we how do we live it for ourselves like in the way that you just just described is just, just that that's there is the the learning the notes part but then there's also the jazz and the fluidity that's just about the connection itself and um so for ourselves but then if we're in a position like that that uh that I am a lot and I think you are too in, in various ways of of sharing it with other people right other people learning this from us I find, you know, it's a, it's such a dance, you know, to use another metaphor, uh, uh, such an intricate dance, I find of how, how to get those mechanics across, but in a way that I ultimately think is it's, it's so, it's so deep in the sense of, of shifting from just this sense of a, of a separate self into how we're connected in a larger way. And, um, so take the idea of needs, right? That we all have these universal needs or that, that that's something that we can connect to our language of, of what we're thinking and feeling and how that relates to our universal needs. But it's really common in my experience, people learning NBC saying things like my needs and your needs, you know, and, and, and Marshall would talk that way sometimes. Um, but there's still that sense of like me as this, this ego, this ego that that needs things to be a certain way and needs and wants and um, which is part of it's like really important part of human experience like that is, you know, that's what we normally experience. But then there's, in my experience, like what consciousness is really about is like, there's a way to experience ourself in a much larger way instead of this sort of small finite way, right. And, and I just often struggling times with how to get across what I think this is really, it's about both, maybe both that kind of individual kind of separate level and this like interconnected interbeing um, level of, of, of identity of like who we are, that's yeah. beyond just this limited self, right? And so how, in, in, in how people can learn, like what is observation, feeling, need, request? Like I find I, I really want to convey the jazz of Felonious Monk. You know, I wanna, I wanna somehow get across even when we're learning the notes yeah. that that's like, that's where we're kind of headed is like you can, you can do this amazing 
jazz sort of mer immersion experience with with something much larger. Um, but I wonder if you have anything to say kind of about about that dance of uh, with with um, maybe the learning of this and, maybe, and 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 how to negotiate those. I don't know, maybe, maybe you said it, but um, it, I don't know how much you're, you're offering this kind of uh, teaching or training or to other people at this yeah. time, but um, anything you want to say kind of on that level of, of like conveying this to others, like your mom or whatever, like these, these different dimensions of what is this really about? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I get really excited about this because this has been a, a, a learning edge for me. Uh -huh. I realized, and I was talking with my partner about this, and I realized that I have the tendency to use NVC, nonviolent communication, like a, a, a conflict vacuum cleaner. Mm. And it's like one of these things where I turn it on and it is going to take away the conflict. Like, you know, just like, um instantly and i realized that if i use a technology like empathic communication clarity communication to sort of evaporate conflict i'm missing out on something mm -hmm. so i was sharing with my partner the other day that a conflict came up between she and i and i realized that i put my my vacuum cleaner on i turned it on instantly because i wanted to just evaporated. I didn't want to feel bad. Mm. And what we kind of realized together, because she practices NBC as well, is, is there a gift in this conflict? Mm -hmm. Is there a gift in the uncomfort, the discomfort? Is there a gift in the messiness? And so as much as I advocate for everyone's needs being able to be met, there's something that I add to that, mm. which is the needs can be met maybe not right now, mm -hmm. maybe not right now in this, in this moment. Mm -hmm. And what offers itself is in the stickiness of it, in the awkwardness of it, is a gift. Mm -hmm. Is a gift, what, what does it feel like for me to hang out with unmet needs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can I bring that consciousness aspect of, of my awareness in this moment of like, oh man, I would really like this. And and my partner's somewhere else. And right now I'd really like reciprocity and that's not unfolding right now. She's mm -hmm. busy meeting her needs. I'm busy trying to meet my needs and it's not, a, we're not connecting. Yes. So I just wanna say that there's, there's like this huge kind of talking about that field beyond right and wrong that Marshall Rosenberg would quote Rumi. Yeah. You know, that's a field that I, I find myself making a journey towards mm -hmm. that I'm not always at. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm feeling like my partner's wrong. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm feeling like I'm right. Mm -hmm. And there's a gift being in that moment as well. And that's where self-empathy and compassion come up for me. It's like, can I, be, can I be with myself when I don't have a solution for the conflict that's brewing between my boys in, in the back seat of the car? Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. I be with myself with mm -hmm. the messiness when I don't have an answer? And I can't access observation, feelings, needs, and requests because I'm triggered. Yes. So I'm learning to lean into the idea that, yes, needs can be met. And when they're not, where am I with myself? Yeah. Yeah. So you're make, reminding me about like, like needs. As I was pointing a little bit before, needs can be like, we can think of like your needs, my needs. And instead of like our needs, like the, from the me to a kind of a we space of, of, of what we all need and sort of feeling that the needs are something larger than us that we sort of connect into, but it's not like mine or yours. And I think what you're saying to me sounds similar. It's like, we can often be like, my needs aren't being met or like, you're not meeting my needs. Right. Or, yeah. Right. And in NVC, like people learning this work, right. Can get so into that level of conversation and communication. Right. And what you're pointing to just now is as I think of it, I'm curious what, how you think about this, but um, that needs being, um, you know, there's a kind of, 
are they met or not met and trying to meet them level of our experience, which of course is there. And then there's just sort of like being with the needs themselves, whether they're met or not, just like what people like Robert Gonzalez, who you mentioned earlier and others in the, in the NBC world, <clears throat> long time folks, this idea of the beauty of the need or the fullness of the needs that that's not so preoccupied with, are they met or not met? That's yeah. more just being in the energy of those needs. And that kind of gets to the spiritual dimension, right? Where not so focused on our form and materiality and the things that we want or don't want, but more just kind of being connected in this way that's very in and of itself. There's a lot of joy and a sense of peace that is can kind of transcend any any given experience, you know, like the conflicts with our partners or kids or whatever, right? And just the last thing I'll add though, it's so easy, I find if those of us really drawn to that level of exploration, what this idea of bypass, right? We can do this spiritual bypass of kind of like denying, oh, what I don't, I, I don't have needs anymore, you know, I don't, uh, I'm beyond, you know, so how to be really in the nitty gritty of our vulnerability, because I think needs give us a sense of beautiful vulnerability. And at the same time, tasting this kind of spiritual dimension in a way of at least of our own experience, that isn't about the materiality of wanting and needing things, but it's something else. So um, anything you would say about that, 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 you know, that tension and the spiritual bypass tendency in there. Yeah. It's like I, I ask people, hey, are you breathing right now? Hmm. Yeah. Well, then you have needs. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, it's uh, I'm very familiar with that term, you know, spiritual bypass. And for me, that means like sometimes, I, John, I just want to feel good. Yeah. In this moment, I just want to feel good. And I realize how precious that is and that sometimes I don't feel good. So for me, it brings up the phrase, good morning. Morning being M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Mm. And Marshall talked about this, me really having a relationship with morning mm. or what some people call beneficial regret. Mm. And I really would like X, Y, and Z right now. It's not showing up. And I'm, I'm freaking frustrated and disappointed because of that. Mm -hmm. And that there can be a spaciousness that I can hold for that. Yeah. So that it's not so much around trying to feel good as much as possible, but it's like, I'm willing to be naked and honest, vulnerable and real with the fact that I really would like some things to unfold right now. And they're, and they're just not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm at the, in the outs, on the outs with my partner. I mm -hmm. can't connect with my boys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's bills due that I don't have an idea on how I'm going to be able to pay them right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I can go into that place of blame mm -hmm. and shame. Mm -hmm. And or I can inhabit this place of, hey, I'm really bummed right now. And I'm, I'm going to be willing to inhabit this spaciousness of unfulfilled needs right now. Mm -hmm. And what does that look and what does that feel like? What does it look like to feel like, say, I'm not going to do that spiritual bypass thing where I'm going to try to binge watch something or distract myself or, you know, the idea of pursuing that idea of sort of anesthetizing myself. I just want to numb out right now. And if that's real for me and I choose to do that, at least there's an awareness of choosing it. Yeah. yeah. Choosing it. yeah. And that for me is like gets back to the self-awareness and the consciousness piece. Do yeah. I realize that I'm trying to, to numb out right now? Yeah. Can I do that mindfully? Yeah. So that there's a, cert a certain sense of awareness where if I am binge watching my favorite Netflix show because I don't want to worry about X, Y, and Z, then I'm doing that out of a sense of awareness. Yeah. This is not. So yeah. that's, this, is, this is where the, there's a beautiful playground for me. Um, and this gets back to you know, when I work with my clients is really helping them cultivate because a lot of people don't even have an awareness of, of mourning, M-O-U-R-N, that word, and having a relationship and cultivating 
not getting what I want. Mm -hmm. It's basically about what's the strategy to get me what I want. And a lot of times the NVC can kind of serve as that strategy. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not careful, it's like, how can I get rid of this unpleasant feeling or this uh, unpleasant situation with my coworker? How can I excavate that? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, I want to slow down. If we can reach a connection point where something is revealed and you can find yourself resolving um, a conflict, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if not, how can I be with myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like how you talk about that, Corey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let, how about we see if we can kind of take this and segue a bit into the 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 larger kind of social level of things. Yeah. Uh, Cause that to me is another place where, you know, the rubber meets the road, so to speak of, of this work really. And, t and trying to take this work into places where it's difficult. So one is our relationships and conflicts. And then at the larger level, you know, what's happening culturally, politically, um, uh, in economics, so all these these kind of larger levels, the systemic, the structural, the cultural. So yeah, there's so much there. We and and I think um, we mentioned at the beginning conscious capitalism, and so because I, I I now have partly because of this across the aisle work that you and I have been doing, and all the things we've been hearing from different people that come on and share from lots of different perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, what is, what is the solution to like the tremendous wealth inequality and, um, and poverty and, um, the way that, you know, discrimination happens so much on so many levels, uh, still, and, you know, is, 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 is the, you know, to me, democracy is such a, um, amazing kind of human invention that we can self-govern and that we've come up with ways to do that. And, and yet, you know, the way that economics and business and corporation plays into that and other, other things that can kind of erode and de degrade our democracy, right? So sometimes I think, well, capitalism is just flawed from the beginning, like here in the United States, uh, and I, I really would like want to hear your experience or have you, if you're willing, share your experience. That, but like, especially since since the summer and the the, the social justice and justice uh, really that's come, you know, uh, so into mainstream awareness in a way that wasn't there before. But the idea now, like that, or what I'm more aware of now, that United States was based on you know, the economics of the United States was based on slavery and genocide, you know, slavery of, of, of Af with Africans that come over and then we brought over and then the genocide of Native Americans and, and, and taking the land and just, you know, and killing many of them. And so that was a big driver of our economics and our, the, the capitalism that kind of arose out of, you know, this consumer-based systems that um, just seems like exploitation is almost like baked in and oppression and domination systems and thinking and like, can you make a profit if you're not dominating somebody or something, right? So I'd just love to somehow get into those issues with, with, with you and hear your perspective and your experience on it. And also how this relates back to communication and how do we take what we love to do with what we call, whether we call it nonviolent communication or or empathic or clarity communication? Like, how do we take that approach into this level of like where do what how do we you know where do we go from where we are now? Yeah. And how to contribute to that? Right. So that's a lot. I just sort of laid at your feet there, but um, wherever you want to start with any of that, I'd love to love to go there. You may have to interrupt me several times here because I can just start going and going and going. Right. Uh, so during one of our across the aisles, um, I think you would ask me or it, come, it had it come around, this is a beautiful circle where people can express themselves and how they're feeling about politics and stuff. And so in one of our events, I had a chance to share my own. And this term emerged 
out of my awareness in that moment that I call contextual compartmentalization was the, was the phrase I used. And, and so it's interesting when you talk about democracy, we talk about history, interesting, his story. Mm. We talk about narratives and experience. And I think it's very telling, especially this being the week where at least US citizens are celebrating something called Thanksgiving. Mm. And there's a narrative associated with that, which is that the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock and there's a whole narrative and a story that goes along with that. And, and so when I talk about <clears throat> contextual compartmentalization, it's sort of like in order for me to fully believe a story about the pilgrims in Plymouth Rock, that I can't look at the plight of the indigenous Americans that mm. were here before that and their mm. story. And it's like, if I am finding myself um, a, a Trump supporter, mm. that I can't hear the narrative of why Colin Kaepernick would want to kneel at an NFL game. Mm -hmm. So it almost becomes a situation of like cognitive dissonance. Like mm. in order for me to fully be invested in one narrative, I can't be open to any others. Mm. And so what's happening in our time now is that that got disrupted on May 25th, 2020, which is oddly enough, my birthday. Mm. I was in New York at the time mm. and, um, and I was with my boys and May 25th was the day that George Floyd was murdered. Mm, mm. And because of the coronavirus, and because people were, for the most part, sheltered in place, the world was watching. Mm -hmm. So the George Floyd situation is not new. Mm -hmm. it, it's not an outlier event yeah. in the history of African Americans in this country. Yeah. The fact was that our eyes were all watching it collectively as a country, as a planet. Yeah. And that's what made it so significant. Mm. And so in that moment, it's like that contextual compartmentalization thing got rocked, mm. it got disoriented. Yeah. And as a result, you had the world watching a murder and seeing through the eyes of the African-American experience to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And so when that got rocked, our foundations got rocked. Mm -hmm. Our comfort zones got rocked. Mm -hmm. our, our, our perspectives got a little shaken. Yeah. Not a little shaken, a lot of shaken. Lot of shaken yeah. And so there was a part of me that was like deeply disturbed by the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. and a sense of gratitude that it got seen the way that it did. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So that his life was not um, just something that you know happens and maybe it's in the back of a newspaper. It got worldwide notice. And then as a result, I'm standing on a corner two weeks later with a gentleman that says, um, Black Lives Matter for Asians. It was an Asian gentleman that was standing there on the corner with this picture. Mm. And I wanted to take a picture with him. And in that moment, it was like, it sparked um, a worldwide awareness and a movement. Mm. And so it's a really interesting time, John, because I feel like that contextual compartmentalization, because it's gotten disrupted, there's an awareness going on. Mm -hmm. and I think we saw it in the last recent election. Mm -hmm. And so wherever you may land in terms of your allegiance, and I say that literally because it's like with politics, it could be very, very... Um, easy and convenient for us to create our boxes. Where do I lie? Am I in the blue box? Am yeah. I in the red box? Yeah. Am I in the green box? Am I in the, you know, coronavirus is created to X, Y, and Z. Some may use the word conspiracy box. Yeah. You know? And so as we all find our tribes, you know, we found our tribes and tribalism is something that is definitely distinct. I think that it's with what we do with across the aisle, Mm -hmm. what we do with what I do with NBC and and moments where Black Lives Matter becomes a, a global um, noticing mm -hmm. that we take a moment, at least for myself, to say, OK, do I have space to hold someone else's story, mm -hmm. even if it's not convenient? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Do I have the capacity to hold someone's experience, even though that jars and, and bumps up against how I'd like to perceive the world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it, and, and for me, there's, there's an opportunity for healing. And once again, this is less about making something right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's just holding the spaciousness for, this is this person's experience. Mm. I may not agree with it. I may not resonate with it. I may not even want to believe that it's true. Ah, that's the real point of growth for me, John. It's like, can I accept something? Am I willing to accept someone's experience even though it doesn't match my own? And even though I desperately, I would desperately like it to match my own because then it, um, it undergirds how I see the world. Mm. Mm. So now to have that juxtaposition of like, I'm seeing the world differently now because I have a spaciousness to let something else in that doesn't confirm my worldview. Yeah. And what does that do? That opens up a can of worms of like that certainty that I really wanted. Yeah. I may not have it now. Yeah. And that's okay. So at this point in time, it's like, we're really, it's sort of like, um, we're, at least for me, I'm being invited to explore, explore the world in ways that, don't always meet comfort. Yeah. And I realize that there's a human need for certainty and predictability. It's huge. Yeah. And yet when I cordon myself off to only certain sound bites and, 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 and only certain data, mm -hmm. how does that sort of isolate me? It's comfortable, but how does that isolate me into inhabiting a world that is somewhat small? And if I'm able to open myself up to other experiences, how do I grow? It's not convenient. It's messy. I'm still working through it, especially when we're on um, across the aisle and I hear someone that may be a, a Trump supporter and they're expressing something that in my mind is like, ah, it's really hard to digest that right now. Yeah. And to be open to it. And not so much is it true. It's like, is it real for them? Mm. And if it's real for them, then I can hold space of compassion. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're talking about, right. This, this real, like bursting into a, a into a kind of collective awareness, things that are more like we didn't see them as easily. And, and there are these different worlds, kind of these different tribal perspectives, right. As you're saying, and, and we're becoming more aware of them and yet still, we can easily polarize into our own and want to resist those others that did, but there's the more dissonance that we're aware of, right? Yours. I forgot the word you term you use, but there's this dissonance of like what I know I believe. And yet I'm so aware of what others believe that's different. And, and so that's where the, the communication work, I, I think you're speaking to the, the, the ability to empathize with other people's, worldviews and paradigms and what the belief systems and it gives us with 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 this practice the ability to not just go to war with that or write people off or disconnect yeah. or experience a kind of unhealthy conflict but rather utilize these differences to try to like um have empathy for what isn't comfortable or isn't our truth or reality but still how do we hold people that do believe these things we think are really untrue or misguided or whatever, but, but how to, right. So the practices you're speaking to of, of on that level, having empathic communication and speaking and listening from that place, we can hold each other's experience. Right. Yeah. So that's what I, that's what I, I hear you saying. And there's a question I had in there um, as you were talking for you to speak to of like, um, ah, it slipped away. But as I'm reflecting that back in a way, it's, it looked like you might've wanted to say something at, at some point. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, it's like, uh, I call it co-holding. Mm. I didn't come up with the terms, but it, it, the term, but it's like, can I hold this space where I can have compassion for someone who might look at things completely different than me? And there's, the, there's sort of the habituation for like, they're wrong, here are my set of facts. Here's why they're wrong. And there's only a certain place that I can go with that. And so you talked about the country 
and I call it, you know, the United States is an experiment. It really is an experiment in democracy. Mm -hmm. And so as we're looking at sort of the, the fall, the autumn season of something that is going away as we know it, certain structures are, are being challenged, mm -hmm. systemic structures. Mm -hmm. You know, we can look at that as a death. And, yeah. and, and autumn sort of represents, you know, the leaves are falling and things going mm. away mm. that no longer serve us. Mm. So instead of resisting that, it's like an opportunity to be like, okay, we're going through this autumn period mm. of our experiment called democracy. Mm. We really believe that this is a democracy that's for all people, or is it one that when we look back at certain structures that are really about benefiting some and not um. others? Yes. Just, and, and, you know, I'm being honest about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, when we talk about uh, capitalism, you know, um, to your point about how the country, the United States was built on the blacks, uh, the backs of blacks. Yes. You know? Yes. I believe there's a, you know, slaves built the White House. Yeah. Just to have that like, wow, okay. Like and for real, like in real terms. Like for real. Terms, yeah. Yeah. And so we can have a conversation of, Corey, verify that. Where is your factual substantiation for this, that, and the other? We, could have, we can go there and we'll mm. be like bumping heads. Or we can have a conversation of, okay, Corey, if, if that were true, and I happen to believe it is, yeah. what does that mean for, um, about our country? And this is not about, you know, uh, shaming or blame. It's about you know, it, it's so interesting. I had an opportunity to visit the um, African American Museum mm. uh, that was just opened a few years ago, mm. and it's a, a, a few. It's down the street from the White House, mm. and so just the juxtaposition, the experience that I had of going to this museum, and I and I when it's open again for you to um, physically visit there, I uh, I recommend that anyone have the opportunity to go to this museum and in Washington, DC, stones throw from the White House. Mm. And it takes you through this uh, experience, John, of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. And literally the experience of starting in the museum, you take this elevator that goes down, oddly enough, and it starts at the bottom. Mm. It takes you through the transatlantic slave trade and all the details and, and the pieces of that history. And you literally wind yourself up through this historical experience of, of Africans in America that became African-Americans mm. and just the, um, the diaspora of the experience and mm. of the pain mm. and of the resilience and of the, mm. the moxie. Mm. And it is really uh, unearthing and unsettling and yet a redemptive experience mm. for me as an African-American to experience. And I imagine for anyone that wants to have that experience, mm. seeing the robes of the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, literally just standing there between me and some fiberglass mm. and just looking at them saying, wow, somebody wore that, mm. you know, and I recognize that some would say, hey, yeah, that's the current day, you know, the Ku Klux Klan still exists. Yeah. So in many ways, it is um, very informative to go through an experience like that. And then it's also very um, concerning to know that there are certain parties and certain ideologies that still are, are, are trying to live. Um, so I'm saying all that to like say- Like white, white supremacy uh, organizations, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. So, you know, when um, Larry Kudlow, who is, I believe the, the head of the economic arm of the Trump administration, at least currently today, Mm. Uh, was asked, is there such a thing as systemic racism? And he said, there's no such thing as systemic racism. You know, that concerns me. Yeah. Because that goes back to that um, contextual compartmentalization. And so I would invite someone like Larry Kudlow to have, I would love to have a conversation with someone like him. Mm. Because what does it mean to um, acknowledge or even entertain the idea that there's such a thing as systemic racism? How would that inform his world and his perspective if he were willing to consider something like that yeah so when we're looking at capitalism we're looking at this journey and i realize i'm speaking about it as a black man as someone who identifies as as male and black having lived lived in this country for 
47 years mm. and that that's my journey and that that's my experience. But to your point, uh, indigenous Americans, um, people of all creeds and colors, we all have narratives and we all have stories. Mm. And for me, it's that my story doesn't have to negate someone else's story. Mm. All I'm asking is that, is there spaciousness for me to hold my story and someone else's story and for that other person to be willing to maybe hold my story? Yeah. And what do we gain to learn from that in our willingness to be like, you know what, this may not comport. When I try to put these two stories together, it gets messy and that they knock up against one another. And maybe there's some benefit in doing that. And I feel like that's what we're doing as a country right now. We're knocking up against our narratives. Um, There's an opportunity for us to grow and learn through that. It is so moving to me to hear you talk about this. Really, it's touching me deeply. And I, I want to see if I heard something right there that when you talked about the autumn of, of democracy, maybe in a way, by looking at the challenges currently going on to our democratic, you know, basic kind of structures. Um, I wonder if you're saying like these things that weren't being so visible, you know, the, the of, of um, the, the, the racism and, and um, the sexism, all, all the ways that it wasn't really a democracy all along from the beginning. It wasn't a real democracy for everybody that was a citizen here. It's been working for some people, but many others not as well. And a lot of systematic and cultural inequalities, right? And I wonder if you're saying, even though it's so uncomfortable now with so many different truths popping up in narratives and stories of people's experience and so different than other people's and what is true, a basic kind of questioning of even what is true anymore. Like, it seems like we're sort of unmoored from some basic consensus of truth and reality that sounds like you're saying there's like a potential in there as that collapses, like there's a kind of collapsing or a decay, a, 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 a falling of the fall, the autumn, that yeah. then maybe this kind of a, re, a rebirth, a, a springtime of, of a, an even um, deeper, wider, truer sense of democracy can emerge out of what right now seems so almost chaotic and 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 um disruptive to our basic sense of kind of society but i i I, yeah, I think i'm hearing in what you're saying like it could actually be a doorway to a fuller democracy in a way so is that did i did i hear that right yeah and um thank you for reflecting that john that you know for me democracy it's it, we're going through some some growing pains of it. And is it going to represent ideally what, where, where there's equity mm. and there's, you know, access, equal access mm-hmm. to resources. And I realized that, you know, there's a book by, um, I believe he's a Republican, either Congressman, he's a politician and he, and he identifies as Republican named Ben Sass. And he wrote this interesting book called Them Mm. which is a real interesting look at the political divide and how what we're really seeking in the midst of the separation is community. Mm. We really want community, but when we create community, oftentimes we- Exclude, yeah. Exclude by default. Yeah. And so what does it look like to kind of look at that and say like, okay, I'm benefiting from my need for connection and inclusion, but how is exclusion actually a, a byproduct of that? Yeah. Look at that. And to look at class structures. Yeah. To look at a, a, a situation of redlining where you're literally marking out places on a map where um, people of color are not invited to, um, to participate in the American dream yeah. or relegated to certain areas right. um, where they can only, um, you know, uh, uh, purchase land mm. or, or buy into the American dream. And so, um, This is where it kind of segues into uh, conscious capitalism, Mm -hmm. which is uh, a movement that John Mackey, who was the co-founder of uh, Whole Foods, Mm -hmm. co-owner of Whole Foods, you know, started um, a number of years ago. And it's this idea of what does it look like to use a model of capitalism where historically it's been about the haves and the have-nots, 
Mm -hmm. and looking at it from what does it look like for equity to really emerge when it comes to, you know, the consumer and the stockholder and the business owner and the employee and mm -hmm. making sure that there's equity within all four of those quadrants. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm really excited about that movement. And I'm also something that I'm very, very, very um, passionate about, John, is financial literacy, especially when it comes to the African-American community. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about capitalism, that's something that is very striking for me when I'm looking at studies about income inequality and just the disparity between uh, people of color and, and my European American brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and, and, and the canyon that exists between. And what does it look like for us to have more of an equitable system where there's access? And, and if you go into African American neighborhoods that, you know, we're looking at the fact that there's a, a check casher next to a payday lender, next to a liquor store, next to yes. you know a food desert, yes. per se. What does that say mm -hmm. about our communities? What does that say about capitalism? What does that say about you know a, a certain habitual environment and culture that is it life serving? Is it allowing someone to um, um, get out of a, a certain situation economically? Mm. So, and that we all play a part of that. How can we all be a part of that awareness and mm -hmm. that access? Um, so there's, there's, there's a, a gentleman named John Hope Bryant who has a fantastic uh, organization called Operation Hope. Mm -hmm. And he's really about um, educating and informing people of color about their finances. What does it look like to become financially viable? Mm -hmm. um, what does it look like to have access to resources in a way that you're empowering yourself because then that that informs the other pieces hmm. so if if i have uh economic empowerment that that then informs what things are like at at home am i breathing easier because i'm able to navigate economically in a way that's sustainable hmm. and i'm not and i and i move from a place of just survival to thrival mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm very, very interested in, in uh, speaking to people about and, and advocating for, because um, we are at a, um, a pivot point in our democracy. And so we can go back collectively to our compartments and try to exist out of there. But I'm very hopeful that we've kind of gone to a place where those boxes are actually too can't small. Can't go back. Yeah, they're too, we've outgrown. The, that shell, we just can't fit back in. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like we're the chicken inside the egg, John, mm. where it's like we're becoming too big to fit in this egg and we're cracking through the shell, yet yeah. we don't know what's on the other side. So yeah. we're like, ah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I know what's yeah. on the other side. And yet it's going to happen getting too big for that shell. Yeah. So then I have the question, well, and I, just to link back in what we talked about, about communication, right? So commu the, the tools, the skills, the whether it's mindfulness or language the, the, to get combined, that how to listen to others' experience, how to express our own experience and how to have those difficult, difficult conversations around all these things we're talking about, right? Like that's a, a way to play a a role in how this this emergence out of this one space into something larger could happen, right? I want to ask you, uh, with the time we have left, so government, some people think government is an answer, like, you know, that business can't do it because of these market forces and, and, um, and that profit-driven motives, that, that it's just ultimately you know, there's going to be abuses and taking advantage and um, that you need the government to regulate. And they're the only, that's the only body that can do it, that they can kind of rein in the excesses of capitalism and do maybe do the kind of things you're talking about. Right. But then others would say, and this came to me out of our across the aisle conversation. And what I heard some people say is like this tremendous fear of government and, and government getting bigger and bigger and becoming not just socialist, but communist and how communism we in, in a lot of places or the experience of communism is it turns authoritarian and totalitarian. And, um, and so this big fear of government getting too strong. So yeah. I realize it's not a sim, I was thinking, oh, well, it's just government needs to get bigger and stronger to, 
to, to kind of equalize all these playing fields, right? And make it all like, but I do see that, right, human, given our human proclivities, we can take something like that and that can become a source of dominant, of, of, of oppression through government systems and, and, and right. So I'm curious if you, oh, and one other, let me just, because we're going to running out of time a little bit, the whole identity politics thing, right? So the more that um, identity becomes something we want to say, let's pay attention to it, like racial uh, or, um, you know, sort of ethnic or class identity or sexual orientation, those kind of identities become so political, then it can become polarizing and a way to blame and shame people and it creates all this backlash, right? So those are kind of two different things right, right, right. related to what you were talking about, kind of as this awareness comes, how do these backlashes to deal with that? And, you know, what's the system of government to deal with like supporting that and can capitalism itself do it without government or does government have to play a big role or some kind of role? So we don't have too much time, but any last thoughts on all of that? Like it's a lot, yeah. but. Oh, wow. That's really juicy. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> How much time do I have? No. Yeah. Um, I'm really, first of all, I'm just enjoying the dialogue. And, um, I'm enjoying the, the exploration because some of these things I've sort of thought of. And then as you're asking, it's kind of teasing it out of me. So I'm yeah. at a, a really juicy point to sort of articulate things that have been in the background. So I appreciate this space for that. So I, I, I'm aware that there is a group right now that would sort of like to start anew, like a clean slate, like let's abolish the government as it is and let's start anew. It's yeah. sort of this thought that I've heard. Yeah. And I kind of, I'm interested in that because the idea is that we would start anew. My sense was we would have the same thing after a while. And this is why we would, we would it's sort of like this idea we would start anew, but it, yet if we have that same consciousness that built capitalism and government as we know it, we would have some other iteration, maybe by a different name, but the same consciousness would be there. So for me, it's like, let's get with the consciousness first. Mm. Do we in fact want to have a society that is about equity and equal access? Mm. Do we really want that? Or is that an optical or a talking point? Mm -hmm. That's something that we're just putting on the outside saying we want it because it's a PC thing. Or is that something that we truly want? And are we willing to have the bravery to say, I don't know what that looks like? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a part of the mind that's like, if I don't see distinction, if I don't see classes, then I don't know where I fit in there. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. I lose my sense of self. Yes. So just to address that sort of internal human fear that I have, it's like, if you show me with uh, the, the middle class and the poor and the well-to-do, well, that gives me distinction and contrast. So mm -hmm. that gives me a sense of where do I fit in the midst of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we sort of like whisk that away where everybody has access to everything, how does that in many ways sort of question our place in life? Yeah. So just to have those kind of introspective questions about the fear that may lie underneath of someone that's like, I don't want to get rid of this. Right. Because I know who I am in the midst of this. Right, right. So that's the first piece, just to have a conversation about, you know, and it's almost like we have a conversation that's like Pepsi or Coke, <laughs> communism or capitalism. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, there's seven up, <laughs> you know, there's Sprite, <laughs> there's, you know, and I don't advocate for drinking, you know, carbonated uh, soda all the time, but I'm just using that as an example, yeah. right? We got Dr. Pepper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the spaciousness is where I kind of go with all of this. Like, mm have the conversations about the conversations it's like mm. a meta conversation about mm. man you know i really like this idea of of everyone having a fair shake and i gotta tell you in my heart of hearts i'm scared because that i i have amassed a certain amount of wealth mm -hmm. and i'm scared that that may take it away yes. um you know or even someone that is like getting food stamps and they're saying 
I don't know what it's like to be outside of that reality. It's scary mm -hmm. for me. That's foreign. I like knowing that I'm going to have my EBT. I'm, 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 I like that comfort of knowing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, yeah. and I know that there's every experience in between that. So I'm not trying to in any way pigeonhole um, what I'm saying here. I'm saying that as we look at the government, they go back, it goes back to what Marshall Rosenberg said. We have gangs on this planet. Mm -hmm. And gangs could look like inner city gangs. They could look like corporations. Yeah. They could look like everything in between. Yeah. So the idea that we have these tribes or boxes, and it's an attempt to meet needs. Mm -hmm. We have a government because it's an attempt to meet needs. We have corporations attempt to meet needs. We have inner city gangs to meet needs. And, and so when I look at it from that standpoint, it just allows me to look at it through the lens of like, okay, we're at this place now where, to go back to the chicken and the egg, we're bursting through the shell, John. Mm. It's not pleasant, but it's a part of our evolution as spiritual beings having a human experience. Can we break through this shell with a certain aspect of compassion and willingness and curiosity? Mm. Or am I going to do it kicking and screaming? Mm. Or is it going to be a combination of both? And if it is, <laughs> Can I go through this mourning the things that I'm seeing fall away from this tree as we, met, as we move into winter? Yes. And am I willing to embrace, embrace things that are somehow foreign to me and yet I'm getting a sense that this is for the greater good? Mm. Mm. Wow, I love how you, how you kind of in a way summed it all up and I, and I heard this returning to the theme of conversation and what I, I like to call empathic conversation, having empathy for one another's experience in difficult, difficult conversation because it brings up all our, as you said, our deepest fears and insecurities and, and, and fears of survival even in ways. So um, yeah, having, having that consciousness about um, what's going on in, in others and ourselves and having those, having those conversations. And if we can do that, hopefully we can navigate through the autumn, through the winter into a, into a spring of, of some, some, what is it called? Um, in terms of democracy and uh, moving towards a more perfect union, I guess, right? That's been the experiment to be moving in that direction towards a more perfect union and yeah. uh, we certainly have a ways to go but um but yeah i love how we talked about this today and uh would love to do more of it with you have more uh, of these sessions and go deeper in some of these areas so uh but i'm just delighted for the conversation thank you so much Corey. i learned a lot i experienced a lot as you spoke really touched me and moved me and uh, yeah, actually, let me move us to back to a uh, kind of gallery view to finish up. Yeah. So anyways, I just want to thank you so much for, for having the conversation with me. Any last words you want to say before we end? Oh, man, I think I've, I've said it. I've said it all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm really grateful to um, um, Michael Beckwith, who's my mentor and also my son's godfather. I'm mm. grateful for... Um, Marshall Rosenberg. I'm grateful for Martin Luther King Jr. I'm grateful for Malcolm X. I'm mm -hmm. grateful for all of these beings that have been on the planet that have been pointers. Mm -hmm. Next step in human evolution. Um, I'm grateful for um, our politicians. And uh, I imagine, you know, they're doing the best that they can mm -hmm. based on where they are in, in, mm -hmm. in their world right now. And, mm -hmm. and I say that for all sides of the aisle. We say both, but I say all sides of the aisle, recognizing that there are many perspectives, there are many stories, there are many narratives. And uh, I'm grateful for the work that you're doing. Uh, you and, and, and throughout the years, I've been a fan of you and, and Ike Lassiter. So I've mm. learned a lot from you. Mm. And um, this is a very, what I call jazzy time to go back to the Thelonious Monk uh, oh, yeah. metaphor. Yeah. Where people like you and I, it's important that we're in this world that we're having conversations like this and that having a full out conversation like this or someone going to an, an NVC, nonviolent communication training are beautiful. 
And it's like one of those interactions. You may find yourself somewhere and you're just with someone or I'm with mm. someone. Mm. That has such an impact that mm. we may never know mm. that all of it is precious and impactful. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, more. Uh, I want to have a lot more of this with you. All right. Take care. Let me just turn off the recording here.